Martinez from the University of Constance. And on behalf of my co-convener, co Professor Anna Ever and my own, I would like to welcome you all, all the participants, uh, to this already seventh lecture of the series. And um, the series is organized jointly by the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Studies and Humanities, by the Faculty of English of Adam Mickiewicz University, and the Poznań branch of Bilingualism Matters. And together with my colleague Anna, we have con convened, convened this series of open lectures by outstanding researchers, distinguished scholars, and well, experts in the field of bilingualism and multilingualism. Our series is approaching to its end. Uh, we still have one, one more lecture to go after Theo's, after today's lecture, but nevertheless, it's our great pleasure and honor to welcome our guests. Professor Theo Marinis, and I would like to ask Anna now to do the introduction. Over to you. Okay. So Theo Marinis is a professor of multilingualism at the University of Konstanz and at the University of Reading. He is also the director of the Center for Multilingualism at the University of Konstanz. His research focuses on language acquisition and processing across populations of typically and atypically developing learners and aims to uncover the nature of language processing in typical and atypical language development. His research has been funded by research councils in the UK, the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, as part of the cost action, he led the development of the litmus sentence repetition task for multilingual children. And he is currently coordinating the huge EU funded project, the multilingual mind. Um, and besides, he is also our collaborator in the team project uh, funded by the Erasmus Plus program. So um, these are the introductions and now Theo, it's over to you. Great, thank you very much for this very kind, uh, first of all, invitation to be here. It's an honor to be part of this um, lecture series and also for the very kind, invita um, the very kind introduction today. So I'm gonna share my screen. I hope you can see my screen now. Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. So um, the title of my talk is Multilingual Child Language Acquisition, Comparing the Development of the Heritage to the Majority Language. And this comes from a collaborative project together with Tanya Kupish, Maria Ferrin and Miriam Geis. Uh, and the project is called Questions and the Interfaces and is funded by the German Science Foundation. So I'm gonna start with a few words about multilingual child language acquisition. As you probably know, multilingual children are a very heterogeneous group. And maybe it's not, it's not a group, it's many different groups. It may, it's many different individuals. And the heterogeneity comes from the different language history and also the outcome of language acquisition in the two languages. I'm trying to. One type of multilingualism relates to children who grow up speaking one language in the home, and this is usually the home or heritage language that is different from the language of the society they live in, so the societal or majority language, and this is the focus of the presentation today. The heterogeneity depends greatly on the amount of language exposure and use in a formal environment, so the school, and the informal environment, which is typically the home. Language exposure and use changes dynamically when children start attending kindergarten and school, and this is when the majority language 
becomes more and more important. And children typically bring also this majority language back into the home. And also the home environment and the language use within the home changes after children go to kindergarten or school. Now research has addressed uh, the language development in this group of children, the children with a heritage language and a majority language. There is already a lot of research within the field, but the results has focused mainly in phenomena that has been, have been investigated pretty well in first language acquisition and second language acquisition as well. For example, the use of articles, gender marking agreement, pronouns, relative clauses. There are many other phenomena that are understudied because they're not the mainstream of language acquisition research. And this is one of the topics of my talk today. We have been looking at the acquisition of rhetorical questions. There is hardly any work on the acquisition of rhetorical questions. So we took the challenge to find out how bilingual children acquire rhetorical questions. I'm gonna start with what are rhetorical questions? So here is an example on the slide, number one, who likes paying taxes? So this is a rhetorical question because there is the common ground, the world knowledge, that typically people don't like paying taxes. So what is a rhetorical question? A rhetorical question is a question. So we have a structure of a question, a syntax of a question, but the answer is known to everyone, is part of the common ground. So we have an interrogative form, but this is not used in order to request information because the answer is considered to already be known and be available to both the speaker and the addressee. And rhetorical questions typically signal the speaker's attitude towards the answer, or it is a, a comment um, on the specific topic. Interestingly, the rhetoricity, because the, the sentence structure is the same between a question that requires to be answered, an information seeking question, and a rhetorical question, the rhetoricity of a question needs to be signaled to the addressee one way or another, so the addressee understands this is a rhetorical question. This is not, I'm not requesting an answer to this question. Quite often, this rhetoricity comes from world knowledge and from the context. So everyone knows um, people don't like to pay taxes. So then this is signal from the context or in the example you can see here in the example number two, everyone knows that within a specific family, no one likes to eat liver. So someone says who eats liver. And then the context again gives the cue. However, apart from the context, there are also linguistic signals about what is a rhetorical question compared to information seeking question. And those linguistic signal vary across languages. I'm gonna give you some examples for German and some examples for Italian, because the population that we're looking at are German Italian bilingual children. So in German, there are some prosodic characteristics that give a cue that this is a rhetorical question and not an information seeking question. A rhetorical and an information seeking question may be string identical, so they have exactly the same form and exactly the same words, and the disambiguation can be done only with a prosody. The characteristic of uh, the rhetorical question, the prosodic characteristics is a low edge tone and a late peak accent, longer constituent duration and a breathy, a breathy voice quality. So here we can see in the example in the spectrogram on the top, uh, who likes vanilla, Wehrmachtig vanilla. Um, we can see that we have this late peak. This is a rhetorical question. And at the bottom, we have an information seeking question, Wehrmacht and Vanille. 
So we can see that in the spectrogram that we have the early peak versus late peak. And this is one of the cues that differentiates information seeking questions from rhetorical questions. And there is also the breathy uh, voice quality that sometimes I'm able to make and sometimes I'm not able to make. And there is also a difference in duration. So this is our, uh, these are some of the cues for German. And those cues have been identified uh, by Bettina Braun and her colleagues, and also Nicole Dehen, her colleagues at the University of Constance, before we started with our project. Apart from the prosodic cues, there are also lexical cues. And these are the discourse particles in German. One discourse particle is the particle schon, which means already. Um, so here we have an example. Was hätte ich schon tun können? What could I have done? And there is also den schon. Each one of them are a different discourse particle. But if we put them together, they give a very strong cue for rhetoricity. Wer ist denn schon Bananen? Who eats bananas? So if we put the prosodic information together with the lexical information, then we get a stronger rhetorical cue. So these are the rhetorical cues for German. Italian has different rhetorical cues. Um, so the prosody of rhetorical questions in Italian is less studied than in German. Uh, up, up until now, there have been only two studies looking at the prosody of rhetorical questions. The studies by Sorianello, 2008, 18 and 19. And what they identified in terms of prosody cues for rhetorical questions is in terms of the boundary tones, they are more often low in rhetorical questions, more often high or rising for information seeking questions, longer duration of the final tonic vowel in rhetorical questions, and a great pitch excursion in information seeking questions than rhetorical questions. So here we can see again um, on the right, we can see the rhetorical question is on the top this time. Um, and we can see that uh, we have um, um, low boundary tone here. And here in the information seeking questions, we can see the rising. In terms of lexical and morphosyntactic cues, Italian has also some particles and the use of particles has been studied more than the use of prosody in terms of rhetorical questions, but mainly on formal or written language. And this is why when we started the project, we did um, a, a small study to find out how adults, what kind of cues adults use um, when they produce rhetorical questions in Italian. And it turns out that in terms of the particles, they use the particle ma, and the particle E, uh, ma chi mangia le banane, e chi legge il giornale. And then in terms of information structure, they use clitic rightist location and cleft structure. Uh, here we also have chi li mangia i broccoli, So as we see, the cues in Italian are slightly different compared to the cues in German. So another question is, how do the bilingual children acquire the cues in the two languages? Because they are different. So in our projects, we are... ...to some developmental aspects um, how do they interpret rhetorical questions in relation to their ability to interpret non-literal meaning in general, because rhetorical questions have non-literal meaning? How do they interpret context? And um, how do they, um, what are the language abilities in general in terms of attitudes, in terms of intentions? Uh, 
Um, and of course, this is a phenomenon that relates to interfaces between prosody, syntax, and the lexicon. So children have to integrate information from different um, sources, and that makes it an interface phenomenon. Now today, I'm going to present only about prosodic and syntactic use, and I'm not going to look at other aspects of the project. We're going to be talking about questions like who eats bananas rather than who likes to pay taxes. As I mentioned earlier, uh, rhetorical questions have not been explored in language acquisition research, and they are at the crossroads of syntax, prosody, intonation, the lexicon, and also the discourse context. And quite often, rhetorical questions provide also some content relate, related to irony. We make ironic statements quite often, and they also relate to theory of mind. That's why these are also two aspects that are important. And because we're looking at bilingual children, there is a potential that there's going to be some cross-linguistic cross influence from one language to the other. Their acquisition will probably relate to effects of language history and language dominance. And there may be differences between German and Italian because the cues are different for rhetorical questions. So the aims of the study was uh, to find out whether bilingual children have access to the cues for rhetorical questions during their linguistic development. And in particular, we wanted to look at whether they can perceive the difference, the prosodic difference between the two sentence types, whether they can comprehend rhetorical questions compared to information seeking questions, and how do they produce them? So if we ask them to produce a rhetorical question, are they gonna use the prosodic cues, are they going to use the lexical cues and the syntactic cues in the same way as the adults, or are they going to use different cues? And given that the coding strategies differ across languages, do bilingual speakers, children and adults have different coding strategies in each of the languages, and do they differ from monolingual speakers? And here you can see in this slide some of the factors that we have been looking at. Uh, the study includes children between the age of six and nine years. We have Italian majority language. We also have two groups of monolingual children, one in Germany who are monolingual German, one in Italy who are monolingual Italian. And along with the child study, we also have an adult study that looks at first generation Italians who moved to Germany. So they, are, um, they have Italian as a first language, German as a second language, which they have learned when they, uh, after puberty. So looking at second language acquisition of German and a group of second generation um, heritage speakers, which is adults who grew up in Germany with Italian as a heritage language. Basically, this is the group of children if we look at them when they're adults, plus monolinguals in, in the two different uh, countries. The task we used was a perception task. We wanted to find out whether they perceive the difference prosodically between the two, um, uh, between the two types, rhetorical and information seeking question comprehension task and production task. We also had a, a proficiency tests to find out what the proficiency level is in the two languages. We use the Ravens matrices to find out how their cognitive abilities are. A theory of mind task because we talk questions relate to theory of minds and also an irony task as a baseline task to find out whether there is a relationship between how good they are to comprehend irony how good they are in the rhetorical questions. Today, I'm not gonna talk about all those groups. I'm only gonna present data from the child study, the bilingual group, and the comprehension. Uh, I already mentioned these are the 
the factors that can lead to individual variability. So we have collected information about all those factors so that we can look also at individual variability. The research question for the presentation today are three. Are six to nine-year-old children able to comprehend information-seeking questions and rhetorical questions? What role do the linguistic and extra-linguistic factors play in the interpretation of rhetorical questions? So the prosody and uh, lexicon and syntax on the one hand, age and dominance on the other side, and are there differences between German and Italian? We collected data from 84 Italian-German bilingual children, and here you can see in the slide the different age groups. We had roughly around 20 children from each age group uh, at the age of six, seven, eight, and nine. The initial plan was that we would go and test children face to face, but because of the pandemic, we were not able to go to the people's houses or schools. So the study was conducted online. We connected with them via Zoom, and then all the tasks were done online with them. And there were several sessions. So there was the German session and there were the Italian sessions. So they didn't have German and Italian within the same session. All the tasks were integrated into a detective game. Uh, and so the children were being trained to become little detectives. Um, and in terms of how we modeled the comprehension task for rhetorical questions and information seeking questions, um, we introduced the Disney uh, story um, of Cinderella. And so we have Cinderella, which is very nice and she's very interested. She wants to know a lot of things. And so she's the person who is asking questions because she wants to find out about many different things. And then there is also the nasty sister who is very, uh, who makes ironic statements, who makes nasty statements. And who, this was the person who was asking the rhetorical questions. And so they would hear questions and then they were asked, you know, who's, who asked this question? Is it Cinderella or is it, is it her sister? And then they had to click which of the two people was the one who asked the question. And of course, um, the voice was exactly the same. So we, did, we had the same uh, people recording information seeking questions and rhetorical questions, which we then we manipulated to make sure that the prosodic cues were exactly right for the specific question. So we didn't ask specifically for, is that a rhetorical question? Is that an information seeking question? They had to select who was saying that specific question. And at the end, they, did, they got a, a detective certificate that they succeeded very well because they found out who was asking what question. So the children really enjoyed that activity because it was embedded in a game. And then they were also getting stars. Every time they completed a task, they would get some stars. So let's move to the task. Uh, so the experiment was a forced choice experiment that we conducted in SOSI survey. Um, the experiment had 30 WH questions of the type who eats bananas, in German, wer is bananen. And um, we recorded the questions without any context, and there was no context when the children would hear the questions. And the task was in both languages, and we pseudo-randomized who would get the German uh, task first, who would get the Italian um, task first. And so they had to tell us or click whether it was Cinderella or Drizella who was um, asking the questions. Um, here you can see the different conditions we had. In terms of prosody, we had the information seeking prosody and the rhetorical prosody with the cues that I mentioned earlier for German and for Italian. And in terms of lexicon and syntax, we had uh, neutral sentences that didn't have any particles. 
and the sentences were who eats bananas. We had ambiguous sentences where again, the information seeking question, the rhetorical question was exactly the same and it was ambiguous. The prosody gave the cue. Uh, and then we also have the clearly rhetorical cue from lexical or syntax, where we had that only with the rhetorical prosody, because if we gave the information seeking prosody with a rhetorical cue, that would be an ungrammatical sentence. So in terms of the German stimuli, the information seeking prosody was a prosody with an early peak accent, model voice quality and shorter duration. The rhetorical question had late peak accents, a breathy voice quality at the beginning and longer duration. The syntactic manipulation for neutral, there was no cue, there is bananen, who eats bananas. The ambiguous cue was the particle den, and den can be used with both information seeking and rhetorical. And the clearly rhetorical cue was den schon. So you can see here, Weist and schon bananen. And here, this was a very clear a cue for rhetoricity, both at the prosody level and at the lexical, at the lexical level. For Italian, the prosodic manipulation was the, for information seeking questions, rising boundary tone, shorter duration, wider pitch range. For rhetorical questions, a low boundary tone, longer duration, and a smaller pitch range. For the syntactic cues for neutral, again, as in German, no cue. The ambiguous had clitic right dislocation, and we have the example in nine, Kilo Mangel and Melone. And for the rhetorical, we had Ma together with the right dislocation, Ma Kilo Mangel Melone. And I'm going to come to the results. I'm going to present first the German data and then the Italian data. So in this slide, you can see the results for the six year old, seven year olds, eight year olds and nine-year-olds. And on the left, we also all, always have information seeking questions. So this is accuracy in percentage in terms of um, success with the information seeking, information seeking interpretation, rhetorical interpretation. Um, and this is when it says information seeking, that was in terms of the rhetorical cue of information seeking, and this is the um, prosodic cue for rhetorical questions. We have neutral, neutral cues, ambiguous, and rhetorical cues. So what we see, first of all, when we, if we focus on the information seeking questions, we can see that the scores are extremely high. Now, the dark line is the median. So we can see that from the age of six onwards, the median is 100%. At the age of eight and nine, almost everyone is at 100%. There are a few outliers. At the age of six and seven, there are some children below 100%. But as you can see, uh, it's not that many and the range uh, is, is uh, not very large. So they are comprehending, they're using the prosodic cues. I'm sorry, there is a sound. I have to stop for one minute. I'm very sorry. No problem. No problem. So I'm going to I'm going to go back. Um, so we can see that the um, success rate in information seeking questions is very high, and this is also irrespective of whether we have a neutral cue or an ambiguous cue. Now, when we look at the rhetorical questions, the performance is lower 
compared to the information seeking questions. And this is also across the board from the age of six to the age of nine. Uh, and we can see that the performance does go high over time. But interestingly, when we focus only on the rhetorical questions, we can see that when we have the combination of the rhetorical cue um, from the lexicon, the unambiguous uh, particles, together with the prosody, the performance is very high compared to the ambiguous and the neutral. So we can see that in terms of the cues, the clearly uh, rhetorical cue, the, the um, particles do make a very big difference. So when we combine the prosody with the lexical syntactic cue, we have very high performance. And interestingly, there were also no effect of language dominance. So it didn't really matter uh, how much uh, exposure they have to German at that age, that didn't affect their performance on information seeking questions or on rhetorical questions. Now we're gonna to move to the Italian and the um, presentation is very similar. We're looking first at information seeking questions. Similarly to German, the performance is very high. When we look at the rhetorical questions, the performance is lower compared to information seeking questions. And uh, if you remember the data from German, they're also slightly lower compared to German. And again, when we have the unambiguous um, syntactic cue for rhetoricity, together with the prosody, the performance improves. Now, in that case, the uh, unambiguous rhetorical lexical cue um, and syntactic cue for rhetoricity is much better compared to both other cues. We don't have this gradual effect that we found for German. Interestingly, here for Italian, we do find an effect of dominance and also an effect of age. So the children who are, who are, who are more um, dominant in Italian are performing better than the ones who are less dominant in Italian. And the older children are performing better than the younger children. And also from this figure, you can see that the effect of age um, comparing the nine-year-olds with the, um, especially the seven and the six year olds. And especially when we look at the um, cue for rhetoricity. So if we summarize the data, then we can see that in terms of the prosody for information seeking questions, there is, we don't see a difference between German and Italian. In both languages, children are, are very good. They can, process the prosodic cues for information seeking questions very well, and they're very successful. For rhetorical questions, they are better in German compared to Italian. When you look at the syntactic aspects and the lexical aspects, in German, we see that they are better, in both languages, they are better when we have the clear rhetorical unambiguous cues compared to the ambiguous, and for German, the ambiguous is better than the neutral. For Italian, the neutral and the ambiguous are more or less the same. So if we go back to the research questions, um, are six to nine year old children able to comprehend information seeking questions and rhetorical questions? For information seeking questions, the answer is clearly yes in both languages. For rhetorical questions, for German is yes. For Italian, it's not always. So they haven't got there yet, or not all children, not in all ages. The second question was, what is the role of the linguistics and extra linguistic factors? And in terms of the prosodic and syntactic cues, these are important on, in both languages. And especially when they combine together, this is when we see the top performance in the children. Cues rhetorical question successfully. Age and dominance we find only on the heritage language Italian, not in the dominant language German. And we do find a difference between the two languages. So is this 
the next question is, is this because Italian is the heritage language, so they have less exposure to Italian compared to German, or is this to do with the nature of the two language systems? To be able to answer this question, we will be comparing the bilingual children to the monolingual children to, in order to find out whether the mono, and also the two monolingual groups together to see whether the monolingual children in, of German and Italian develop those structures in exactly the same age. We haven't done that yet. We are now collecting data from the monolingual children. So the take home messages from this presentation is first of all, that bilingual primary school children are able to make use of prosodic and syntactic use to interpret rhetorical questions. And this is very important as a message because this phenomenon is very understudied. So the fact that we can see that from the age of six onwards, children are able to interpret rhetorical questions is actually very important because if we think of children being in a school, being in a classroom, um, are the teachers using rhetorical questions or ironic statements when they're talking with the children? Uh, if they are using them, then we know that children would be able to interpret them because they have the skills in terms of the prosody and in terms of the lexicon and the syntax to comprehend the rhetorical questions. The second take home message is that there are differences between the heritage and the majority language, and this could relate to the children's language history. So it could be that the Italian German bilingual children, they have less exposure to Italian, and this is why uh, in Italian, they're not as good as in German in terms of interpreting rhetorical questions, but it also could relate to the nature of the linguistic, linguistic systems of the two languages. And this is something that we will be able to uncover when we collect the data of the monolingual children. So this is um, some um, kind of food for thought for our study when we have the data, but also for many other studies, because a difference between heritage and, and majority outcomes could be because of this reason or the other reason. It doesn't mean that if they are not performing as as well in the heritage language, this is to do with the input. It could be that there is cross-linguistic difference, and this is why performance in the heritage language is not as good as in the majority language. Now, what are the next steps of our project? Uh, we are collecting, as I mentioned, data now for monolingual children to compare them with the bilingual children. And then the next step is also to compare the children with the adults especially for the heritage language, to find out the adult heritage speakers, how do they compare to the children? Are they able to comprehend rhetorical questions um, better than the children or not? We are comparing also the heritage adults with second language learners to find out how do second language learners uh, process and comprehend rhetorical questions. Is it the case that if you've learned a language after puberty, then you're able to um, uh, acquire um, uh, lexical so syntactic cues of uh, the second language? And then what are the effects of proficiency, cognitive abilities and theory of mind? And finally, also, how do all this population produce rhetorical questions? Comprehension study, but it helps. So we have collected the data, also the production data, and one of the next steps is to analyze the production data in order to find out whether they also use the same cues that we provided them in the comprehension tasks. So that was from me for now. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Theo. Now we are moving on to the question and answers se session. Uh, so um, if you want to ask a question, please either raise your hand 
or you could uh, type your question in the chat and we will uh, read them out. So yes, we invite everybody to ask questions, whichever manner you prefer. You're more than welcome to raise your virtual hands or to type in if you'd rather. So take a moment to reflect. And in the meantime, I'm posting in um, our chat um, the website address to our lectures where in the repository you can find um, all the previous lectures and uh, with kind permission of our current speaker, we will also um, um, have our, the recording of today's lecture, if that's okay with you, Theo. Yes, of course. And Thanks so much. I hope you can take out the bit in the middle where there was a noise in coming. Ah, from in the, the background. That's no problem. <laughs> we'll see about the editing.